Welcome to the joint CIS, CSIS, OIS webinar, COVID-19, the energy transition and corporate strategy. This is the first time that the Centre for Strategic and International Studies and Oxford Institute for Energy Studies have actually collaborated together on an oil market seminar. And on behalf of the OIS, I would like to say how pleased we are to be doing this joint project with the CSIS. My name is David Ledesma and I'm chairman of the Natural Gas Programme at the OIS. And it's my great pleasure as well to be jointly chairing this session seminar with Sarah Ledislaw, who is Senior Vice President and Director of the Energy Security and Climate Change Programme at the CSIS. The COVID-19 pandemic presents acute short-term uncertainties for energy demand. And the energy transition is fundamentally reshaping the oil and gas industry. So today we are joined by two distinguished speakers. Uh, Yas Mufti, who is Vice President Strategy and Market Analysis at Saudi Aramco, and Spencer Dale, who's Group Chief Economist of BP, to discuss how companies are adapting the, the to these challenges and positioning themselves for the longer term. Now, this seminar is scheduled to last for one hour, but is flexible to run for one hour, 50 minutes. It is being recorded and it will be available on the CSIS and OIS websites in the future. The structure of the discussion is that each of our speakers will present their verbal views on the subject for around about 10 minutes, and then Sarah and I will ask some questions before opening the discussion uh, to the wider audience for Q&A. Now, we would please like to encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A button, which can be found by moving to the cursor to the bottom of your screen, as I'm sure you're well aware from all the Zoom calls you've been making uh, since March. All questions are, will be treated anonymously, so please feel free to ask whatever you like on today's topic. Now, before we start, we'd like to remind you that during this seminar, you should be mindful not to discuss confidential information and also that nothing we discuss or say should be taken as any form of investment advice. So after that disclaimer, I think I would just like to say how delighted we are to have you all online with us. And we hope you'll find the discussions over the next hour, hour and a quarter both informative, insightful, and of course, stimulating. So without further ado, it's my really my great pleasure to invite Yasser Mufti to make his opening remarks. Over to you, Yasser, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, thank you, Sarah. And I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to dial in. Um, it's uh, remarkable how um, we have strived to maintain contact with friends and colleagues across the world, present company, obviously included in that, um, as you maintain just uh, a network of discussion and dialogue that has certainly helped us um, individually and, 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 and as a company. So firstly, I'd like to wish everyone uh, uh, safety and, 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 and the best of times and conditions as you deal uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the challenges of COVID-19. Uh, so I wish everyone and their loved ones uh, uh, safety on that front. Uh, the second is that, um, and I'm sure we're going to get into it in, in more detail, just a, uh, a reflection on how extraordinary 2020 has been thus far. Um, we have seen a remarkable collapse in demand, um, which hopefully the, the worst is behind us. And we have seen a recovery uh, since then. Uh, we've seen a remarkable supply response. And as we speak uh, at the moment, we do see demand slightly higher than supply. I say slightly higher relative to where we've been, but in historical context, I think we are certainly on a path of rebalancing the oil market. I think there's a lot of questions ahead of us. Uh, we're grappling with uh, the shape uh, and the duration of the recovery. Uh, we, um, uh, we are looking forward to a continued recovery as the world uh, greets the winter season as some normalcy uh, returns to economic activity around the world. Um, um, one of the positives that we've seen is that uh, while we've had difficult news coming out of Europe, say yesterday, um, uh, other parts of the world, notably Asia, has been doing very well. Had we had this call, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, India would have been probably uh, uh, front and center on the discussion, but today, thankfully, we're seeing a nice recovery uh, in terms of that country's demand. So this, this thing is a little bit, uh, thankfully, not synchronized around the world, although the broad trend is still that we see, we've yet to see uh, a peak in, in terms of the COVID-19 uh, situation. I think the government responses have been good around the world. Uh, 
uh, from our uh, role, though I'm not directly involved in it in the G20 discussions, I do see a lot of effort uh, by the G20 member countries to do a lot within their own countries and as well to ensure that there is enough support to developing countries to manage through this. So I think overall, um, I am uh, optimistic uh, that we are going to see uh, better times ahead. Um, uh, so that's in terms of where we are uh, in, in, in the market today. I, uh, I understand there's a lot of interest with uh, regards to the long term. Um, I, I understand we're going to talk a little bit about some of the energy transition themes and a few other things. Um, but I, I will uh, say that one of the reflections we've had uh, in looking at how the suppliers uh, and having a, a a personal look at how we dealt with the big changes in the call on our on our company's uh, uh, supplies was that um, resilience and reliability are really really important. Industry, I think, has taken a beating uh, uh, on a number of fronts of late, but uh, it is terribly important the backbone of the global economy that we ensure unfettered and continuous flow of energy to consumers around the world. And as the fight uh, against COVID has shown us, there's something to be said about the slew of products that are also made from hydrocarbons, anything from masks to medical equipment to supplies and so on, that I think have been vital in the fight against COVID-19. So I think the lessons of 2020 uh, are primarily around resilience, around reliability, around the importance of this, uh, of this uh, uh, resource to the, to, to the world. And um, you know, we can argue and debate the shape of uh, and, and the pace of, of demand growth going forward. But I will submit that we are of the opinion that we still have many, many decades of, 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 of need for oil and gas resources going forward. I'll stop there, David. Great. Thank you, Yasser. Thanks for those uh, uh, interesting and, and, and heartfelt comments. I think we all recognize uh, at this particular juncture, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to have this conversation uh, at this time, that we are we have all as a, as, a, as a global community, but also as an industry been through quite a bit this year, uh, but we're also not through with it. And so it's a, a time of profound uncertainty, both on the short-term outlook and on the longer-term outlook. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is how that uncertainty has shaped what was your pre-existing view of this market balance. You made a comment that you thought the market was, was heading towards a, a rebalance. Can you talk through some of the dimensions of that and how this uncertainty, particularly over the next you know, five or six months, is shaping your view of what that rebalancing trajectory might look like? So I think in terms of uh, total demand, uh, uh, global demand for, for crude oil, we do see a number around the, the just shy of mid 90s, so 93 million barrels a day, give or take, um, consistent with the views being expressed by, by, by the key uh, forecasting agencies. Um, and we do see that continuing and moving, moving forward, I think, um, uh, the world will need more, not less oil going forward. The pace of that additional supply is ultimately a function of you know, the, the pace of, of the inventory drawdown uh, that we will get. That's at the macro level. I think you know, delving a bit deeper, uh, you know, the challenges on refining are quite, quite severe. Um, you know, essentially, even in a balanced market, refiners have to deal with a lopsided uh, demand uh, for refined products. Uh, you know, jet fuel is the weakest of all the products, um, and uh, depending on who you talk with, uh, there's probably anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of global demand for jet fuel that's just not there. Um, and one of the challenges with refining is you refine a barrel of crude oil, you're stuck generally with, uh, you know, so much uh, of, of each product. So I think refiners have had to juggle um, you know, that dimension. Uh, fuel oil was supposed to be under a lot of pressure because of the IMO spec change and, and it has actually done better than, than the other products. So refining has been quite difficult. 
Having said that, I think um, uh, trading has uh, been uh, a, 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 a good area uh, simply because of the volatility and the changing uh, uh, supply and demand patterns across the world that I opened my remarks with. So I, I, think, I think it's been quite a challenging uh, business. Uh, if you look at the different sectors, chemical margins have uh, as well come under a lot of pressure. So um, it, it has been, uh, I think, a time that you know, companies have had to respond to various market conditions, uh, some dislocations, but all told, I think that the, um, at least the view coming in from Saudi Aramco being an integrated oil company, oil and gas company, uh, it has been helpful having you know, multiple businesses across uh, multiple regions, and I cannot stress the importance of the excellent relations we have with our customers around the world, you know, across the different products that we sell, um, you know, as, as you need to be very close to your customers and manage their evolving needs and, 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 and um, uh, you know, changing demand uh, patterns uh, throughout the last few months. And I, I suspect that, you know, this situation is going to be with us as we gradually come back to a normal slate of uh, demand for products and, and petrochemicals. So one of the questions that we get a lot is whether or not um, uh, COVID-19 has accelerated or decelerated or changed in some way this broader trend that many oil and gas companies were facing of this energy transition, right? Transitioning to broader energy companies. How are you looking at the overarching trajectory of the energy transition as it is informed by, by your experience with COVID-19? So I'd like to answer that question, you know, with the with the latter part. You know, our our view around energy transition is that the world needs and should transition to lowering the emissions of the energy supplied and consumed. We do not see transition uh, uh, away from fossil fuels as being, quite frankly, uh, uh, practical or even possible uh, economically or otherwise. So within that framework of, of transitioning to lowering a carbon footprint, um, you know, the priorities for us have been, you know, how do we sustain and expand our upstream carbon footprint? Uh, that to us is a, you know, as we produce one out of every eight barrels of oil. So in our simple, in our simple math, the lower that, you know, that, uh, that, that quantum of oil, the lower the carbon footprint associated with it, that has a significant contribution towards lowering the overall emissions associated with, uh, with oil and gas. Uh, the other is, uh, we think that there is, uh, although some would argue at detriment to long-term demand prospects, the more we can do to ensure that the world consumes um, fuels in an efficient manner would bring down the, um, the, the emissions. At the end of the day, people consume oil and gas to get some utility out of it. You know, you, you, at the end of the day, you buy gasoline to go from point A to point B. The less gasoline you need, uh, the more, in other words, the more efficient you are, the less the, the emissions associated. And so we've, we've spent, uh, and we've continued to spend a lot of effort in working on um, uh, fuel formulation, working with auto companies, uh, to, to improve the efficiency of the internal combustion engine, we actually see that that would have a more significant impact transitioning us to a lower, uh, 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 a more efficient energy system in totality. Um, and, and thirdly is uh, an, an area around the materials transition. Um, if you look at the, the demand for materials, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest now in single use uh, 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 plastics, but there's also a lot of durable goods uh, that could be produced, a lot of differentiated products that could come in. We've, we've uh, switched all of our uh, uh, applicable uh, uh, use for um, pipe to non-metallic pipe. We've deployed hundreds of, of miles of, of pipe in our own system. We're actively supporting research, including a research center in the UK to look at um, uh, uh, developing non-material applications, durable uses for hydrocarbons. Now, um, that uh, we think there's a significant uh, materials transition underway that is closely linked to an energy transition because it's it's better use 
uh, for oil and gas. Uh, quite frankly, they're good margins over the long run. And obviously, the, 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 the final kind of life cycle emissions that you get from them are, 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 are better. Um, so, uh, you know, we think by, by playing an active part in, in, uh, in, in, in the mobility transition and materials transition, as well as ensuring that our own carbon footprint uh, uh, is, is, is being maintained or even dropped lower, uh, we think that we will be ready and well positioned with the with the energy transition. And I know Spencer will probably uh, get into a conversation about this with David as well. But do you still view, or do you view even more strongly, the the demand coming from the petrochemical sector as being a main driver of oil demand going forward? Has that been increased by COVID nineteen, in your view, uh, or was or is your outlook maintained pretty consistently? So when, when we run our own um, scenarios about uh, different uh, evolution of, of supply and demand, consider breakthroughs in technology, different price trajectories, one thing that we do see is that the, uh, the, the demand for uh, feedstock to go into petrochemicals is, um, is fairly robust across a wide range of, of, of scenarios. So yes, we've, we've uh, uh, we've reaffirmed that view, if you will, uh, wouldn't be able to tell you the exact numbers, but we do see a few million barrels a day over the next couple of decades of incremental demand coming in uh, uh, because of that. And turning to gas for a minute uh, as well, natural gas markets have responded a bit differently to COVID-19 than oil markets, obviously. Um, what is your, how has your outlook changed for gas in this energy transition as a result of COVID or, uh, or, or otherwise? I think um, the gas market, uh, quite interesting. I think there's been a lot of changes. We do see uh, that there has been uh, an expected clawback in some of the uh, planned projects. There was simply too much being uh, brought on stream. You know, our interest in gas um, uh, was made public a few years ago because we were looking at opportunities to take our gas business from just being a local uh, in-kingdom uh, gas business to an international business. Very attractive entry points, but rather difficult to make money in this business. So um, uh, I, I, I think that the uh, uh, um, uh, that the uh, you know while the developments are are uh, were needed, you know this cutback in some of the uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, were going to come on stream over the next few years. I think over the long run, demand for gas will continue to be healthy. I think there's strong demand from China. Uh, some of the um, uh, uh, emissions reduction targets that China foresees uh, you know, will require significant quantities of gas to back out other uh, energy sources. Um, and I think that the, the whole gas market has developed uh, price discovery is much better. I know David probably can speak uh, you know, to, to this topic much more, uh, but I think the long-term fundamentals for gas are still, are still healthy. We remain interested in this business uh, uh, you know, because of that. And, and, and we do see that uh, you know, this rebalancing as it plays out, uh, there will still be good opportunities in this business over the, over the, over the next uh, you know, few decades. Okay, one final question, then I want to turn it over to to uh, to David and to Yasser, or excuse me, to Spencer. Uh, uh, in this uh, environment, balance sheets have taken a hit. It's been hard to sustain long-term investment in R and D. Is this been true for Aramco? How are you thinking about your uh, pretty vast R and D portfolio and and thinking about that over this period of time? Um, we are strong believers in R and D. Uh, we've made a serious commitment to expand our R&D uh, portfolio uh, in terms of uh, labs, in terms of people, um, and that has not wavered uh, at all. If anything, um, our response to the energy transition challenge that you talked about, maintaining and even bringing down our carbon, uh, our upstream carbon intensity, um, helping uh, uh, oil be consumed more efficiently, finding creative new uses for, uh, for, for oil. Um, you know, this requires R&D money. We were super excited uh, with our first uh, uh, 
blue ammonia shipment. We were actually quite surprised it got that much coverage, but it was uh, it easily topped a lot of other what we thought were newsworthy items. But you know that that was a product of good R and D work. Uh, we've got the molecules here. Uh, we can produce hydrogen uh, with our affiliate Sabic. You know we do have a uh, capacity in the kingdom uh, to make it into a transportable uh, energy carrier. So it, it's, it's an exciting uh, thing, but it, it, it is made possible by, by technology. And so our appetite remains very strong. Uh, you know, our, our numbers have continued to go up in terms of patents. Although I remind our, uh, our R&D colleagues, it doesn't mean anything when you produce patents at the end of the day, you have to put them to use. But no, we're, we're, we're fully committed to, to, to this. And, and I think, by the way, having the labs around the world from the US, Europe, and Asia has also helped us, uh, you know, as we dealt with the challenge of COVID, uh, you know, we kept people working uh, within reason around the world. You know, we did not just have folks concentrated in one area. So we, we remain committed to that. And, and I think it's a, it's a wise decision that our, our, our leadership and board have been very supportive in. Excellent. Thank you, Yasser, for those opening thoughts. I want to turn it over to Spencer now for his opening comments on the introductory questions we have on COVID and the energy transition. Uh, Spencer, great to see you again. Great. Thank you, uh, Sarah and David. Uh, thank you for the invitation. This is a this is fantastic. Uh, two of my favorite research uh, institutes joining together. So it's a great uh, pleasure to take part in the first one and then to also uh, share a platform with Yasser. So that's um, uh, so the double whammy. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, three points, I guess, or three sort of generic things. One is sort of a, a couple of reflections on the macro environment um, in terms of impact of COVID. Second, the impact of COVID on energy demand. Uh, and third, what does it all mean for, for BP? And um, I think that will then hit your, um, your request, Sarah. Um, I think it's clear already that the pandemic is going to lead to the largest economic downturn since the Great Depression. Um, I think that's been clear for some time now. And the, the only question is, is just how deep and how prolonged will the downturn um, be? Um, Yasser was saying, we spoke about this a month ago, we were, India would have been uh, uh, sent, uh, front and centre, I agree. I also think if you spoke a, a month ago, I think I would have been more optimistic about the outturn than I am now. I think in terms of the surprise over the last month, um, um, notwithstanding Asia, I think the news in terms of Europe and um, the US has been um, pretty bleak. Um, light, the latest IMF forecast points to a falling global GDP of around 4% this year. That sort of is far greater than 2008-9. Uh, with a global output recovery of around 5% next year. Um, but the risks uh, must be heavily skewed um, to the downside. And, and I think, I mean, it's not, 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 have we not reached a peak in, 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 um, in new COVID cases? I think the second derivative is still going up in terms of these things are still accelerating. So we are, and I saw a fact the other day that, um, 40% of the growth in new COVID cases globally has happened from the 1st of September, uh, which is that's a fairly uh, um, uh, sobering thought. Um, and the scars from the pandemic in terms of the global economy will persist for far longer than when the actual pandemic will be, uh, will be consigned to the history books. Those scars in terms of the impact on the business sector and on um, the labor market and people's uh, human capital skills will persist such that I think it's quite plausible that we never get back, the world never gets back to its pre-COVID uh, trend rates it was on. And so um, you know, I mean, everybody knows, but we should just remember we are living through something which is deeply, deeply transformative, um, I think um, at the moment. And just to pick up on the point that Yasser said, the, the lack of synchronization or the imbalanced nature of what we're going through is, is really significant. You can see that within economies where manufacturing sectors can pick up, but services can remain in the doldrums. And you can see even within, within household spending, where you'll see spending on goods pick up, retail goods pick up, but, but, uh, but services and hospitality uh, still be very weak. And you see it really starkly across countries. Um, so latest IMF numbers, US fall in US GDP 4%, then the EU um, something like 
percent india a fall of 10 percent and i think it was only in april of this year that the imf was was forecasting positive growth for india they now expect india to grow uh, to fall by 10 percent over 10 percent astonishing um and the just sort of the the just the huge outlier here unbelievable in, in china um where which looks set for growth year on year growth of two percent or more which is just astonishing and, and stunning so and that lack of synchronization and that imbalance across countries i think could have profound implications as we go forward so this is big in terms of the macro stuff um in terms of energy demand um this feeds through into energy demand just like yasser was saying the main impact coming from just this weaker gdp and this weaker economic environment I think one point to note here is the nature of, of we, we think in our analysis that the, the impact of COVID will fall disproportionately on emerging market economies. Um, part of that is a function of the, the relative lack of health facilities, but most of it's far more important is the structure of those economies, uh, India, Brazil, parts of Africa are far more exposed to the fallout of, of COVID than um, some developed economies. This matters because it's the emerging world which generates all of the growth in global energy demand over the next 20 or 30 years. Um, energy demand in the OECD is flat to falling. All of the growth uh, over the next 20, 30 years is going to come from the emerging markets. The, the very same markets which are going to be disproportionately impacted um, by COVID. And so I think that's, just, and so when we're thinking about the sort of rules of thumb we have in our heads about mapping GDP shocks to energy shocks, I think this type of thing will be bigger than normal because of this disproportionate impact onto emerging economies. And it's, it's worth um, remembering that in mind. We also have built in, when we're doing our analysis, some impact from sort of behavioral effects. Um, we see people um, uh, traveling less, particularly in terms of aviation that relates, relates to the point that Yas was saying about jet fuel. Um, switching their modes of transportation away from mass transit into private vehicles. And, and obviously, and most significantly for big parts of the world in working from home more. Um, I think people got very excited about the, these behavioral effects. Our instinct when we're looking beyond the very near term is many of them are likely to dissipate. So as the pandemic hopefully is brought under control, confidence returns, many of these, uh, many of these behavioral effects I think will be transitory, but I don't think all of them. And we might, my instinct is um, things like working from home will persist um, into the future. I, I, my hunch is, um, I used to be for 25 years, I will 30 years, I guess, it was, given how old I am. Um, I've been going into the office pretty much every day, five days a week. I'm not sure I'm going to be doing that in, in the, in the future. Um, I think the other, in, the, the, the other sort of key issue here, and you, you, you sort of questioned, um, you raised it in your question to, 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 to Yasser was, is the uncertainty, what impact could COVID have in terms of the energy transition. And in some sense, when we're thinking about the impact of COVID on the energy system, to me, that that's potentially the biggest um, potential uh, impact. Um, and there are arguments going in both directions here, and it's by no means certain. You can certainly make an argument why the impact on wealth, the focus on domestic systems and near-term issues could actually reduce the pace of the energy transition. But for me, I think there's also quite convincing arguments in, in the other direction why this could accelerate the pace of the energy transition. The, I think COVID has caused many people to have greater awareness of the fragilities of the planet and the way we live in, in that uh, planet. I think to that together with the sort of the opportunities presented by the unprecedented scale of government interventions that we're seeing now and I can carry on seeing means there's a real chance that the Build Back Better movement could be successful and the pace of the energy transition could be accelerated as a result of, of COVID. And if that is the case, I think that will just dominate everything else in terms of when we're thinking about the impacts of COVID on the energy system. That's still uh, out, uh, the jury's still out on that, we don't know. It's, it, but it is striking um, that in the last few weeks we've had China, Japan and Korea all sign up to net zero commitments. I'm not sure we would have had expected that. 
And I read a report uh, last week which suggested that the number of companies that have signed up for net zero commitments has increased threefold over the last year. So there feels momentum uh, in terms of that energy uh, transition. Um, so the final point is sort of how has this affected BP? Um, uh, as some of the people um, participating uh, in this workshop may know, BP uh, announced a major shift um, in its strategy. Uh, it uh, announced the sort of the bare bones of that in February prior to COVID and has carried on uh, and has sort of put more flesh in the bones in the last couple of months. I'll bore you, uh, I'll spare you all the details in terms of that. I mean, I think the way to think about it is it's pivoting from a company focused on oil and gas and the upstream production of oil and gas to a company which is a broader based energy company uh, focusing on trying to provide uh, uh, energy solutions to customers around the world, to so an integrated, integrated energy energy solutions to customers um, around the world. That pivot was, was sort of pre predated COVID, as I said, and was based on core beliefs about how the energy system was likely to evolve over the next 20 or 30 years. I don't think COVID has fundamentally changed those core beliefs. And so in that sense, um, it hasn't fundamentally changed that direction of travel. But if anything, the pandemic has reinforced some of those beliefs, particularly in the sense if it, if it does lead to sort of in quickening the pace of the energy transition. Let me stop there. Spencer, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very insightful. But I, I, I must admit, the expression you said that all this has exposed the fragility of the planet, that, re that really hit home, I have to say. So I think it was a, a kind of quite a commanding statement. But I think also you said, of course, that the energy transition could be sped up by uh, government interventions are supporting that. And I think you're, you're right. I agree with you. The jury is up. But I would like to kind of mix that together with uh, IOC strategy, if I may, with you. Because as IOC shift your portfolios towards uh, cleaner energy, now where do you think that the competitive advantage lies for IOCs to go to clean energy, such as renewables and electricity? What's your view on that? So I think, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of big picture issue David, which is the rewiring of the global energy system, which we will need to see over the next 20 or 30 years. I certainly hope, I think, I'm sure we all certainly hope we see that rewiring of the global energy system over the next 20, 30 years. Otherwise, we're going to be deeply in trouble and COVID will not be the main thing we'll be worrying about uh, in, in terms of our lives. Um, it will take enormous uh, scales of engineering and enormous um, financial resources and very large global integrated energy companies uh, uh, are well placed to play a role in that. I also think the nature of energy systems are going to come increasingly complex over time. Um, if you look back in history, the history of global energy is dominant. It, it, tends, it tends to be that one or two fuels have dominated the global energy system. You know, much of the first half of last century, the only game in town was coal to a very large extent. Yeah. Coal yeah. declined, uh, but then you saw the increasing dominance of oil. In the sort of scenarios we look ahead, you look at you look ahead the next 20, 30 years, you have a far more diverse uh, energy mix. Uh, oil and, and natural gas, wind, solar, other non-fossil fuels, all providing sizable amounts of energy, far more, far more diverse energy mix, with increasingly that energy mix driven by um, customer choice mm -hmm. rather than upstream availability. This is a different game. And so I think we can play a role in that. We can play a role in terms of helping to um, provide, into, integrate across those different energy, uh, energy sources. Um, if you have a, if you're an integrated energy company providing a whole range of sources, you can provide those, uh, so those integration services more than a whole series of niche players. Mm -hmm. And I think more generally, I, I hope that we can leverage the types of relationships that we've built up over many years to, to, to shift this, this focus, if you like, to a more customer orientated company. And so a big focus of our new strategy is trying to build relationships with, with companies, uh, but with cities uh, and with countries, helping them achieve their decarbonisation pathways alongside our decarbonisation pathways. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you talk about the kind of uh, the integrated energy company and the move downstream, but also this reliability of the value chain. That's something that Yasser said. You know, they're proud of. You know, the last few months have seen reliability of deliveries down the chain. But I'm just wondering, Spencer. You know, when, when we're talking about this move downstream, you know, there's an awful lot of value in the upstream. There, you know, and that, that's been the value that uh, uh, BP, indeed other IOCs, have enjoyed. You know, is there a risk of leaving behind some of these? quite valuable opportunities in pursuing the, 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 the move downstream to more kind of energy transition scenarios. What do you think? I guess twofold. One is um, uh, our instinct is that economic rents over time are going to shift from the upstream uh, to the downstream, but predominantly some of those economic strengths may stay in the downstream, but much will flow to uh, consumers in the form of more competitive lower price energy. And that just reflects the change in structure of energy markets. Uh, yeah. This is a world where you have far greater competition. You have far greater competition across fuels. Mm -hmm. If your view as a coal producer in the 1930s, you didn't have to compete against anybody. You were the only game. If yeah. you're a coal producer in the 2030s, you're gonna to have to compete about across a whole range of different fuels. And so that's a more competitive environment across fuels. Moreover, if you're an oil or gas producer, you're in a world of abundance. You're in a world where energy, uh, at the very least, my guess is um, the global demand for the, your product is starting to slow. It may in some scenarios be starting to fall. And that's and so you're starting to see increasing competition across within those fuels as well. And so I think part there's an economic rent story. So I don't think that profitability partly is a sort of story. Um, uh, is the backward looking story rather than forward looking one. The other point I've made, David, is, is the following. When we produced our scenarios for the energy outlook, we started, we, we were very strong right from the beginning by recognize all of these scenarios are wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the whole point, every, we can't predict the future. We know we can't predict the future. So what we're trying to do as a company is pick a strategy which we think is robust or resilient to a whole range of outcomes. So that means by its very nature, there will be some scenario, if I knew certain for certain what the outcome would be, I'd pick a different strategy. It's a bit like, it's like, a bit like when you're playing musical chairs. If you know exactly when the music is gonna stop, you can be brilliant at it, okay? You know, can you, 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 I was never very good at that one. So, so, um, so the point here is, um, is there scenarios where the world carries out, carries on growing for a period of time and you think, oh, if only I'd known that I could have carried on. Y yes, and there's other scenarios where, where, where it moves in a, in a different um, direction. I, uh, I bored um, Sarah with this a few weeks ago when I was presenting at CSIS. I, we have in my, I, I have this sort of nice quote uh, in my head from uh, um, an American economist, Herbert Stein. And Herbert Stein's uh, saying, which came into Stein's law, which is, if something can't go on forever, it will stop. Okay, it's quite quite simple, but it's quite powerful. The yep. world is on an unsustainable path. Yep. We yep. can't have carbon emissions continuing to grow. Yep. If I'm trying to pick a strategy which is robust and resilient for the next 20 or 30 years, uh, Herbert Stein's um, um, law sort of rings loudly in my ears. Yeah, and, uh, and that law, of course, underpins the complete move of the BP strategy which we've seen. Before we move to uh, bringing uh, Yasser back into the discussion, and I'd like to actually to pitch a question which Sarah asked Yasser uh, earlier on, and that's about petrochemicals, because Yasser saw maybe there's a few million barrels a day of incremental demand over the next few years from petrochem. So you know, in your outlook, do you see petrochemicals as a main source of oil demand growth? So we have different scenarios in in, 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 in nearly all of them, I think in all of those scenarios, um, um, or feed or you, oil, which is non-combusted, used as a feedstock is growing for pretty much all of the scenarios in, in all but one of them. Um, however, we expect the, the, and so yes, it's sort of one of the, the sort of most durable sources of oil demand, but we expect the sort of, if you like, the, the mapping between the growth of incomes around the world and that feeding through into demand for oil into petrochemicals to gradually to be quite a bit weaker than the past and that's partly that's and that that's partly just driven by environmental pushes away from um, plastics and so we'll see technology improving in terms of recycling 
And I think we're seeing greater pressure to use, to reuse products, to recycle products and, and to use different types of products. And so, um, yes, we still see under many scenarios, um, oil demand going into petrochemicals rising, but the pace at which it's rising, its relationship to the sort of general growing prosperity in the world declining because of this sort of this environmental shift and recognition of the, 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 the impact that plastics can have on the world. Yeah, it's, it's interesting there is this kind of the double impact of the pollution impacts of the plastics, but also people still need plastic, so we all need to find alternatives. So, but it was interesting that Yasser uh, observed that was going to be uh, potentially an increase in- And, and, and you know, and I, and I, it's also amazing how sometimes some of these arguments can get a bit a little skewed. If we had said two years ago, single use plastics, everybody would have booed and hissed. Absolutely. Uh, six months ago, single use plastics were saving many of our lives in terms of PPE. And so we, we should be careful about demonizing whole swathes of products um, uh, as well. And so the world is, you know, it's a complicated, uh, these, the arguments are complicated. Absolutely, absolutely. That brings us back to Stein's law as well. Okay, well, look, let me pass you back to Sarah, who I think is gonna fire a question uh, really to both of you. Uh, Sarah, over to you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Spencer, for some great, uh, great observations and your comments. I do want to go back to our discussion, uh, bringing you both together. And I want to just remind uh, the audience members that, that you can submit your questions using the Q&A button below. Many of you have done it already, but we'll go to audience questions after this segment. So please make sure to put those in if you want to get a question in. Um, maybe starting with Yasser and then going to Spencer on this. I mean, one of the things that you've both uh, touched on in your remarks is this idea that COVID in and of itself has had some both economic and behavioral impacts on the energy market. But there is a broader question about what government intervention or policy or stimulus might do to either accelerate or in some cases actually slow down the energy transition. How do you think about what is um, happening on the uh, on the government policy side of this, on the investment side, about um, the difference in places around the world where you actually are seeing a lot of that intervention and that policy, and other places where you just simply aren't. What does that mean for your own strategies? How important is that to your outlooks? Maybe we'll start with Yasser and then uh, go to Spencer. Um. I think it's really hard to have a single view on how policy will plays out in that space. Um, and in fact, even in, in important countries like the US, there seems to be opposing views um, with regards to that, to that very same point. Historically, um, uh, government policy has generally been supportive of, of oil and gas industries as they deal with uh, downturns and, and difficult times, I guess, in recognition of the importance of um, energy, continued energy supplies to the health of their economies. A simple metric uh, of just looking at uh, government take um, from oil and gas production. Typically, when prices are low, you do see that you know companies are able to to to, to claw back, if you will, some 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 economic rent. So. I, I, I think um, and, and, and I believe that policy should be supportive to oil and gas uh, investments across the supply chain, not just in, in conventional areas, but you know, to the point that Spencer talked about, um, you know, the energy system is becoming increasingly complex. Um, you know, there, there's uh, lots of interplay between the, between the fuels, uh, you know, think of increasing penetration of renewables, what does that mean for for reliability of electrical systems, um, you know the need for interconnectivity. Um, so I, I, I think broadly speaking, I, I uh, expect and hope that policy will be generally supportive to uh, continued investments in, in supply. Um, we have always uh, advocated that government um, needs to be supportive to continued investments, to make sure that we don't go through volatility that we've seen, sadly, because you know it is a, a chunky business and we do need to ensure that people invest uh, sufficiently. It's hard to see a case for investing, uh, certainly in the upstream or even the downstream, you know, to my earlier remarks, but you know, that investment is still needed. We're, 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 we're years, uh, you know, we still see years of, of demand growth. We can debate the exact data plateau uh, but I think it's absolutely crucial that we see continued support as in our 
core conventional businesses as well as some of the newer frontier energy areas uh, that companies are exploring today. Thanks, Yasser. Spencer, we'll go to you. So why don't I uh, sort of, I guess my frame of reference for government intervention is in that context of that Build Back Better issue and whether, whether that we are going to use the opportunity of this scale of government intervention to, uh, you know, to turbocharge uh, the energy transition. And I think there are some bits of the world where you can point to as uh, encouraging, other bits are more of a worry, and I've got some big, even bigger question marks than others. I mean, so then, you know, the most obvious bit which looks very encouraging is the EU. I think some of the features of the Green Deal that the EU have announced are extraordinarily um, positive. And I think there's a, it looks, um, um, at least from my perspective, that there's a, there's a chance that, that the EU may do for some new technologies like hydrogen, what it did for uh, wind and solar power um, before in terms of being an early adopter and driving down that learning curve. And so, um, and so that's very exciting. I think my worry is, is much of the discussions at the moment, for understandable reasons, are very country specific focused. And so people saying, I'm going to get my country to net zero. Uh, that's fine. But the countries which are doing this, uh, they got to really remember that there's, that there's other parts of the world. And I guess what I'm really worried about is those emerging market economies I was talking about earlier. They are the economies which are both badly affected by COVID. They are the economies where energy demand is going to grow very rapidly over the next 20 or 30 years. And if we want them to adopt cleaner, more efficient energies, um, they will need support for that. And sort of just sort of just getting your own house in order and ignoring um, other parts of the world, I think, is a, is a concern. And so that's sort of I would like to see a sort of uh, a more um, holistic approach taken by wealthy governments in terms of recognizing the importance of supporting emerging markets. And I, I was on a call with a, a wide range of businessmen in India the, the, this, afternoon, uh, this morning. And, you know, they were saying, you know, the, one of the biggest issues for Indian renewables is the cost of capital uh, that was going into uh, India. And you think, well, this is sort of crazy because you know there's this enormous pool of capital sitting in the West um, looking for returns looking for investments in sustainable uh, investments. And there's this big country whose cost of capital is, is um, you know, somewhat slowing the pace of, of growth there, even though it's exceptional already. And surely we can find ways of putting these two and two together. And I think my question mark, and I, and I think in some senses it's the biggest unknown, one of the biggest unknowns is, what do we make of China's announcement uh, in terms of the 2060 announcement? That sort of, Perhaps I was just not reading the right report, but that caught me blindside. I did not expect that. That's not the path they were on, uh, and uh, that's a very that's a very sharp sort of detour or adjustment from relative to the path that China was on. And um, we know when China uh, wishes to achieve things, it can achieve unbelievable um, um, uh, achievements, and you know it's transform the world in terms of what they've done, reducing the cost of production of solar, solar PV panels. Could they do the same for the cost of electrolyzers? Could they do the cost for, CC, for CCUS technology if, they, if that's a way of carrying on using their coal resources and hitting that 26 years? So I think um, sort of following and understanding China feels to me like a, a really significant part of the story for the next sort of five years, or well, all the way out to 2060, they just better understanding it and how quickly you could start seeing the, those shifts materialize. Absolutely. Well, hopefully we'll get to shift back to that in, in a minute, but I want to turn it over to David. Okay, thank you so much indeed. I'd like to pick up on something which you've been talking about. That's the role of technology and the importance of technology improvement because costs, of course, are critical, keeping the costs as low as possible. So yes, I'd like to come to you, if I may, first of all, uh, and, and talk about kind of, you know, what do you think is needed to accelerate investments in, let's say, CCUS, and also perhaps a far wider question, you know, what do you see the near and longer term role of hydrogen, uh, and what's that, how's that going to impact on your the specific uh, oil and gas markets, you know, what are your views on that, linking that back to technology? So I think, I think there's a uh... Uh, the cost of capturing carbon and sequestering it is uh, rather high. Um, the, um, one needs to find a, 
a captive uh, source for CO2 emissions. Um, and then one needs to find a uh, you know, below ground storage uh, that can take that CO2. Um, I guess the, uh, 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 one of the challenges we've had in the kingdom here as we, we explore is that we don't have depleted reservoirs. Um, and uh, it's actually a, uh, um, a somewhat counter kind of to the thinking we've always had of trying to maintain our, our, our reservoirs and resources producing over the long run. Uh, but, but I think there are some below ground uh, technical challenges, nothing insurmountable, but between finding that and finding, um, you know, ensuring that that CO2 is captured uh, over the long run, optimizing the rate of injection, uh, that there's power associated with getting the, uh, the CO2 uh, and 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 and, and uh, inject, injecting it under the ground. I think that there's so many opportunities just to optimize around it. Um, if if you go push the boundaries a little bit further and say, well, is there a role to um, maybe uh, capture uh, uh, carbon uh, not um, you know at, at at locations distant from uh, where oil and gas is produced, uh, say at where it's consumed and then shipped back with CO2. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, there's just a tantalizing number of interesting opportunities. And I think that um, uh, there's a, a lot of room and scope for good R&D uh, as we, uh, you know, get this technology, really bring it to mainstream, uh, like the other technical challenges that, 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 that have uh, faced the industry. I think with regards to hydrogen, a lot of interesting things, you know, it, it is far more compatible with the, with the infrastructure that we have around the world today. Um, I think in terms of energy density, it easily beats out a lot of other competing fuels. And I think it complements, um, you know, some of the, uh, uh, the new and conventional energy sources uh, that, that are out there. Um, I, I will caution though, I think that the, there's so much excitement and so much uh, opportunity and hope with hydrogen, um, and you know, not not to be critical of different um, uh, uh, you know government support, but we're we're keen on ensuring that um, you know we 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 don't pick and 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 uh, winners and losers when it comes to you know how we get the hydrogen. At the end of the day, you know there's. There's a, a rainbow of different colors associated with, uh, with, with hydrogen. At the end of the day, I'm back to my energy transition argument. We should look at you know, life cycle economics, life cycle emissions, and ask ourselves, what is the best way to get the utility out of the energy um, uh, uh, at the lowest possible carbon, carbon footprint? Mm -hmm. And so on hydrogen, um, our experiment with the blue ammonia shipment uh, for us uh, means that is this um, a new way that we can get uh, energy from conventional molecules, if I can call them that, oil or gas? Can we utilize existing infrastructure to transport stuff, uh, you know, the, the, the hydrogen from the producing areas to the consuming areas? And I think that's, that's the real kind of challenge that our engineers and our, and our, and our scientists are grappling with. So, um, there's still significant scope. And I really wanna also go back to something that Spencer talked about. The energy system is becoming far more complex, far more interconnected. Uh, I will disagree with him in terms of the economic rent remaining for oil. Um, um, but, uh, but, but, but I think that the, uh, because of that, uh, you know, we, we do not have uh, a blueprint for what the future energy system will look like. The interdependencies will be high. Uh, and I think there'll be a myriad of different technologies supporting different needs around the world. And we still have a lot of R&D, a lot of engineering before we get there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I just ask, um, yes, sir, um, the blue hydrogen, your blue ammonia, that was made from, from oil and, and, you was cap and then re-injecting the CCUS, is that right? Or was it from gas? Yeah, it was, it was made from gas. It was made from, from gas. gas. Yeah. Can, could you conceive of a world where you do it from oil? I mean, technically, it's possible, uh, but you've got the infrastructure through the steam uh, methane reformers. Uh, so yes, you can you can get it from from oil. The technology has been around for, yeah. for quite some yeah, time. Yeah, I just wondered if you can conceive of a world where, particularly in a world where your um, resource is so cheap in terms of your base resource, that in some sense you've got to 
it's like a slightly differentiated you can segment your market there's an oil market and there's a hydrogen market and you can use some of your oil to just feed into a hydrogen market conceivably it's quite possible i mean the, the thing is energy if you look at hydrocarbon systems um you know we produce hydrogen regularly within 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 our plants um it's just to detach it from you know wherever you have a uh, a, a, a refining petrochemical uh, uh, like a, a city or, or zone, you know, hydrogen is one of those things that is produced that is, you know, moved around and, and some are long, some are short hydrogen. But I think to take that knowledge that we have and just move it so that it's, it's globally traded as we have with oil and, and, and gas through LNG, I think is the next frontier. But, uh, uh, but yes, uh, it, it, it's all possible. Okay, well, look, I'm, what I'm going to do is, uh, Spencer, I was going to come to you on hydrogen, but I think I'm going to, I've got so many questions coming in from the audience. Can we park that for a minute? Uh, and Sarah, can I pass it back to you maybe to kind of summarize some of these questions? Just one point, administratively, we said we might run this uh, for another kind of 20 minutes to a quarter past the hour. We will be doing that so we can address some of your questions. Sarah, over to you. Excellent, thank you. Great discussion. Um, so we have a number of questions coming in. I'm going to do this sheepishly because I know how Spencer feels about peak oil demand questions after our last discussion. Um, but there are a few. And so one of the questions is, you know, given the cyclical nature of the business that Yasser has talked about, are there concerns about the combination of uncertainty over peak oil uh, demand and when that has occurred, hasn't occurred, will occur, might occur, <laughs> whatever, whatever description you want to give it. Uh, and the, the difficulty of attracting investment to the oil industry and upstream investment relative to what people think about that future. So, and I, I guess one of the things that I'm fundamentally concerned about is not whether there's uncertainty there, but like how big is it and how big of a deal is it? I mean, are, are we in one of those situations where we'll ever see a price spike like we did in 2008 again? Like are those dynamics fundamentally gone from the market uh, or do we still run the risk of sort of miscalculating where we are in that supply and demand balance and finding ourselves back there because we've misjudged the future. So maybe we'll start with Spencer and then go to Yasser. So I I, I, I do think this is a real concern and, and somehow there's this sort of cognitive dissonance people have that, that somehow when they see something conceivably uh, stop rising and plateau and fall, they somehow sort of think that that means that that oil is no longer playing a role in the energy system, which is sort of is sort of a, an odd thing. And even in um, our, our most um, progressive environmental scenario from a from a climate perspective, in which you achieve uh, uh, the world achieves net zero by 2050, which would be an astonishing achievement. Oil demand falls by 75 percent. So oil demand by 2050 is at 25 million barrels a day you still need trillions and trillions of dollars of new investment in, uh, in investment in new oil production over the next 10 or 15 years to ensure there's sufficient oil um, to supply to meet demand, even in that world. So in that particular world, it's one scenario, it will be wrong, but just as a way of ordering our thoughts, which is what scenarios do. In that scenario, oil demand is falling throughout the next 30 years. It falls to 25 million barrels a day. But then the, the rate of natural base decline means you need enormous sums of in, investment uh, in oil um, for the next 10 or 15 years. And I do worry that people sometimes seem to make this sort of odd thing. I think it's just because they don't have the base decline in their minds that once it's peaked, you need to stop, in, you stop investing. So um, it could, could one conceive of price spikes like we saw in the past? Yes, I would be amazed if, if in 30 years time we look back, we didn't see um, um, periods of, of very high oil prices again. I think that would be an amazing thing to think about doing. So, and I do think it's a worry. And I think it's a worry because people um, somehow uh, miss, uh, sort of get, get their derivatives wrong in some sense. And once, once they think oil demand may be stopped and growing, they somehow think we no longer need to keep investing and, um, or, and, and oil doesn't carry on playing a very major role in the, the system. And in that sense, I agree very much with Yasser. I think oil and gas are going to be playing a major role in our energy system for many years to come. Yasser, did you want to add to that? 
I think, um, uh, again, Spencer, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on something uh, again, not, not on your comment on economic growth, but I think, you know, it's also important that a lot of views on investments related to upstream are uh, informed by what the international companies are doing or not doing. And I mean, the, the reality is as important as they are in leading innovation and, and you know, the, 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 the bulk of oil produced today comes from, you know, large number of national oil companies and other I know we've debated this in, in Geneva and elsewhere, Spencer, but I think it's an important point that uh, I, I also caution that what would the views of, you know, the other uh, oil and gas producers, admittedly, not all are publicly traded, not all have to answer to investors and other stakeholders, but nonetheless, I think that there is a, um, uh, you know, a, a number of views and, and, and many companies uh, uh, would say that they still see a positive investment case, are not even worried about any kind of uh, peaking in, in, in demand. It's not deterring their, their investment, their investment appetite. Um, and, and just one comment as well, um, you know, peaking doesn't really matter in terms of investment needs. One of our former board members used to liken uh, upstream costs to healthcare costs. You know, with age, they they only go up, and uh, I think people can appreciate that. And so, you know, you need to continuously invest to fight the declines, fight the depletion, and 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 keep oil growing, especially with the considerations of uh, you know that we didn't talk a lot about ESG, but you know the 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 demands to produce oil. On a or oil and gas and refine it and transport it on a more sustainable basis means, quite frankly, more money will be needed. Uh, so, so costs can only go up, and that front investment needs can only go up. Yeah. Do you think, Yasser, yes, as well, which I think is a point you were making earlier, and, and, and I really agree with this, that we're going to be far more discerning in terms of when we say oil and when we say gas. We're going to become far more discerning in the future as we, as we as we worry more and more about our carbon footprint. And so the carbon intensity of the oil that the world consumes and the car and the, the carbon intensity of the natural gas we consume will become a far greater feature. And, and my instinct is we could start seeing material price differentials for different types of oil, not based on its sort of um, physical character or its physical characteristics but in terms of its carbon intensity and people willing to pay a material premium on on on, on oil with has a low carbon intensity and as, and as you alluded to earlier the kingdom starts at you know in an enormous prime position in that sense and i think it's a sort of some surprise to me that we haven't the oil market hasn't become more sophisticated yet in differentiating between different types of oil in terms of its carbon intensity yeah. Okay. So, so I, I think um, it's it's a very good, very difficult question to answer. I mean, there's a lot of reasons uh, why that you know to your, to your last question why that hasn't you know developed as as many would have would have expected. Um, I, I will just say two things. Firstly, I think that uh, our focus on carbon uh, upstream carbon intensity is is driven primarily by you know at the end of the day, if we want to do good for the planet. Uh, we say, how can we have the greatest impact? Uh, we did a back of the envelope calculation. If the rest of the world matched our upstream carbon intensity, uh, you know, we basically have the equivalent of about 30 million zero emission vehicles life cycle. So, I mean, we know it makes a considerable, a, 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 a considerable difference. And the other important point is um, the, the economics of reducing your upstream carbon footprint, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm not giving any competitive stuff away here, it is good business because it means you're lifting oil more efficiently out of the ground. And you know, those of you that have worked or uh, you know, have experience in the upstream will know you need to expend energy to get barrels out of the ground over the life of a reservoir. And so uh, less upstream carbon footprint means more efficient lifting of oil, which generally means better reservoir practices, which means extracting, you know, a, a greater economic rent from the barrels of oil. So there's actually a good business case of, 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 doing, of, of doing just that. And certainly that also applies in, in, in the sector I operate in, the LNG sector, and the greater efficiencies in the plants uh, for all the reasons you're talking about. I'd like to actually pick up, if I can come back to you, Spencer, because you, you said 
the, you, about the huge investments required uh, in the future. And one of the questions that's come in is, do you believe in a significant future oil supply gap, significant capital letters, because of the COVID-19 financing gap and or green finance intentions of financial investors? So let, let's look at that and say, what is going to be the implications of green financing intentions of financial investors? And also another question links to that, you know, what could be the effect potentially of more stringent regulations on methane leakage? So perhaps you could comment on those two points. Yeah, I, my, my instinct on the first one is, do I see a, a very significant supply gap in, in, in oil supplies is, is not for any sustained period to be my guess. And it's sort of for the same reason that, that Yasser said, which was there's an awful lot of potential oil supplies around the world, uh, some far less affected by um, sort of the need to uh, attract green investment and, than others. And sort of markets work, David, right? We sort of know that. I'm an economist, sort of markets work. So we see prices high, then that will attract capital and, and capital will find a way of flowing um, to high returns and high prices. And so will you get periods of, of gaps? Of course we will. And that's why we see spikes. Um, but, I, but do, do it, are we going to see a sustained period? My, my hunch is not, because there's enough different sources of, of, of oil supplies around the world along the lines that, um, that Yasser suggested. I think, um, I think greater methane emissions, uh, uh, regulations on, on methane emissions are, are critical. I think the amount of, uh, of, of flaring generally in, in gas and methane emissions is still is something which the industry is very acutely aware of, and it needs to um, uh, 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 get better and better at doing it. I think we know that monitoring technologies are, are improving. I think a number of companies, BP, along with many others, have committed to very substantial uh, reductions in, uh, and significant improvements in their transparency of, uh, of, of how they measure their methane emissions and then commitments to, to reduce them. And so I think that's important. And I just going back to that same point, and I think customers will be more discerning in, ter in terms of the, the products they um, consume. And I, David, it's, your, it's far more your area than mine, but my impression is quite, you know, it's a big topic within natural gas markets at the moment about people reducing the carbon footprint of the LNG cargoes um, they are supplying. And I, I can imagine within Europe, I think that this is, you know, when Europe is thinking about the carbon content of the natural gas it's going to import, um, some of that in the gas is importing via pipelines that starts at quite a significant advantage relative to the gas, it will, which is having to be um, liquefied, put on a boat, shipped halfway across the world, and then regasified. And, and I think so, and I think consumers will become more discerning about methane and, and carbon footprint more generally. Yes, I, I'd really be interested in your kind of views on that because uh, not only is it the, the methane uh, emissions we've been talking about, but also the availability of finance potentially for oil investments. It, how are you approaching that in, uh, in, in Saudi Aramco? So I think our experience um, having tapped international uh, uh, debt uh, markets uh, lately um, and our experience of going public um, and just judging from the appetite from investors in the opportunities to invest in and around our space. Um, and I do not proclaim to speak on behalf of the industry, but I think it's been very positive. Um, um, so I, I think there is interest in financing. I think there are uh, demands uh, around um, um, you know, expectations. And again, back to the whole ESG thing that um, uh, 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 investors um, would like to see. I, uh, I do not see that this is going to be a significant impediment. I think that the, the oil and gas industry has to up its game. I think over the long run, um, uh, you know, if I can just take a, a bigger picture, uh, you know, the world, uh, you know, the, the financial community is seeking yield for good reasons over the long run. I think our industry, for all the reasons we've been talking about, can provide it. Um, uh, and, 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 and I guess there's a, there's a, a, a good meeting point in between uh, where these two intersect. Um, uh, 
Now, and again, I cannot speak on every uh, jurisdiction and different expectations, but our experience has been that yeah, the work is needed. Uh, answers have to be provided to some good questions, uh, but I, I don't see it over the long run as being an, 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 an impediment. Spencer, Yasser, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time for our discussion today, and it's certainly been an interesting one for everybody participating. We're really sorry that we didn't get to all of the good questions that you put in the question and answer session, um, and hopefully we'll have a future one of these to be able uh, to get to some of those. Um, on behalf of myself and David, OIES and CSIS, we just want to say a big thanks to Yasser and Spencer for participating today. Uh, you put a lot of really interesting ideas on the table. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, and thank you to all of you for participating. We hope to see you at a future event. And in the meantime, everybody take care. Thanks so much.